so as many of you have seen by now, I'm out of the hospital. Maddie's in critical condition, but he's stable, and I'm sure with any luck he'll be out soon too. I've got something serious to say though. A lot of people have been asking questions on here and I've seen a lot of things flying around social media that just aren't true. I know this post might be a wall of text, but I really do feel like I need to set the record straight on a few things. As you all know, me, Maddie, and my little cousin Paul went down to Crosby Beach over the weekend to enjoy some of the nice weather we've been having. We went down on Sunday afternoon with a few beers and a disposable barbecue, purely with the intention of having a nice little scran and some bevies. I want to make that abundantly clear. We weren't going looking for trouble. This isn't part of some mad gang beef, and we don't live like that. We're not thugs. We just went down to the beach on a nice sunny afternoon to have a good time, and it turned into an absolute nightmare. We got there, had our little barbecue, then, because the wind picked up a bit, we moved into what was basically a pit among the sand dunes. We were there for quite a while, listening to music and drinking cans, and it's coming up to nine at night. It was still dead sunny out, and the beach was basically deserted apart from the last few families and groups packing up their stuff. We stayed long after they left, and round about the time the sun was starting to set, Paul runs up to the top of the dunes and tells us he can see someone walking towards us from way off down the beach. Paul said the man was on his own, just walking down the beach. Then he stops and starts looking at Paul. That's what he said, anyway. Like he stopped dead in the sand and turned a bit as if he'd just spotted him. And then he started walking towards us. I was asking who it was, but Paul said he didn't recognize the bloke and continued to watch him approach us before backing down into the dune pit with us, saying, he's coming. I'm quite nervous at this point, but... When the bloke appeared at the top of the dune, he looked perfectly normal and just said hello to us. We exchanged a few words, told him we were just having a few cans. He then nodded in approval, asking us if we'd had a good day. It was basic small talk like that. Then out of nowhere, he asked if we believed in God. There was a bit of a pause where all three of us could tell that something was a bit off about him. I mean... That's just not something you ask someone seconds after meeting them, is it? I didn't want to offend the fella or anything, so I told him I'd keep an open mind. And Paul said no, but Maddie said yeah, he did. That he went to Catholic school and his nan was from Ireland and all this. The bloke didn't seem very interested in our answers, but hearing Maddie say that he was Catholic seemed to get his attention. The fella just starts staring at him and it's so awkward that... Maddie has to ask if he believes in God in return, just to fill the awkward silence. The fella doesn't reply. He just pointed at Maddie and said, It's you. Maddie asked if they'd met before, then started to apologize if he didn't remember him, but as he's doing this, the lad started walking down into the pit. As he gets to the bottom, he says, I'm sorry, I just need a bit. It's only a bit. And I think he's about to rob a can off us, or worse, mug us for our wallets or whatever. But he keeps walking through the sand towards Maddie, and that's when I hear our Paul shout that he had a knife. I only saw him stab Maddie once before I rushed him, but I know he was trying to stab him again as he went down. I tried to pull the knife away from Maddie, but the guy only used my momentum against me and brought it down into my leg just above my knee. Feeling it stop after hitting bone was the most horrible part, and I'm really, really lucky that it didn't cause more bleeding than it did. After he pulled the knife out of my leg, he actually looked down and said, sorry, but as he looked at the knife, which was covered in mine and Maddie's blood, he smiled. I honestly thought he was going to finish us both off there and then, like this man is obviously not well, but for some reason he didn't. He wasn't saying sorry because he was going to finish us off. He was just saying it before he ran up the dune and disappeared. Paul got out his phone and started dialing 999 and for a minute I just focused on putting pressure on the stab wound near my knee. But then I looked over at Maddie and saw that he was in much worse condition. He'd been stabbed in the stomach so I used my t-shirt to soak up the bleeding and put a bit of pressure on it until the ambulance arrived. I thought they'd just send an actual ambulance out for us, 
but when I saw that they'd sent a bloody helicopter, like an air ambulance, I was more scared than I'd ever been in my life before. Like why would they send something like that if Maddie's life or my life wasn't in serious danger? I got seen to by nurses, but Maddie went straight for an operation to repair the damage the stab wound had done, and that's the last time I saw him awake. I went to his room in the hospital on the day I was discharged, but he was out for the count and the nurses told me not to wake him up. The operations were a success though, I've not heard about any complications or anything, so I'm hoping he'll make a full recovery. He'll have a nasty scar on his belly though, same as I got on my leg. As for the attacker, none of us had seen him before, and as much as we gave the police some quite detailed descriptions of him, he's not been picked up to my knowledge. We haven't gotten some secret feud we're not telling anyone about. We don't sell drugs, we're not in a gang, nothing like that. This is a totally random attack, I need to make that clear. If anyone saw a bloke walking around Crosby on Sunday night, wearing all black training gear, please contact Merseyside Police. He had brown hair, dark blue or brown eyes, medium height with a skinny build and spoke with a quite thick accent. You can contact DSO with any tips and the whole thing will be in Wednesday's Echo. Please don't hesitate to help us catch who did this. They're very, very dangerous and they almost took Maddie's life. If we don't get them into custody, someone else could get hurt and it could be bad. I have family over in Australia, so for two Christmases when I was a teenager, we packed up our stuff and traveled all the way from the UK to Brisbane to spend a month with them. The second month we spent with them when I was 19 was honestly the best four weeks of my life. The first visit when I was 14, not so much. It wasn't because I didn't get on with my cousins. They were wonderful, like little replicas of me and my brother, just with Aussie accents. And it definitely wasn't because of the weather or food or anything like that. No. My first trip to Australia was a nightmare because of, you guessed it, the wildlife. Because of the area and the time of year, my Aussie uncle Tommy warned us of mostly about brown snakes. He told my parents to keep kids away from the garage, the shed, any overgrown areas because not only were brown snakes very venomous, they were really bloody aggressive too. So for the first week or so of being there, I'm avoiding any bushes or long grass like the plague, just praying I don't bump into anything slithery or bitey while playing in the well-pruned garden with my cousins. Only this time, we're playing on the beach and I suddenly need a wee. But instead of thinking to go in the ocean, I slink off behind some trees to pull aside my bathing costume and do my business. But no sooner am I in the foliage, I see this massive snake all curled up. I don't know for certain if it was a brown snake or not, but I definitely wasn't about to stick around to find out. I bolt off back in the direction of the beach, screaming about the snake, and this freaks my parents out a bit while my cousin takes off to do a stand-up wee in the water. Not my proudest or most graceful moment, but far better than squatting next to a friggin' snake. My point is, I think I'm safe at the beach. I can go deep in the water, can't go into the bushes, but there on the beach it was actually safe. So after a late lunch of beachside barbecue, I wandered off to some rock pools not far from where we were all camped under the shade of our canopies. I'm alone, just dipping my toes in the cool water while eating one of those cheap ice pop things, literally thinking to myself, this place is alright if you ignore the snakes, I wouldn't mind coming back sometime. Then as I'm waving my feet around in the water, the swirling is kicking up some of the sand at the bottom of this rock and suddenly, I see something tiny swim up around my toes. I obviously reacted with fear at first, pulling my feet out and peering down into the water to see what it was. Then to my absolute delight, I saw the tiniest little creature swimming through the water. A tiny little creature that I assumed was a baby octopus. I mean, it was so small that it looked like it had fit in the palm of my hand, and seeing its little legs kicking in such a cute, coordinated way, oh my god, I just had to pick it up to get a closer look. 
I started trying to scoop it out of the water with cupped hands. It takes me a few tries, but I eventually manage it. Only once it's out of the water and I'm staring down at the cute little guy wriggling around in my hands, my mind is blown when it actually changes color. I had no idea that octopi could do that. Chameleon, sure, but octopi too, that's amazing. It went from yellow with black spots to black spots being filled with these almost luminously blue-colored rings and it was honestly one of the most amazing magical things I'd ever seen with my own eyes. Then right when I'm in the middle of admiring the thing, I feel this tiny little nip in my palm, no more painful than a sharp pinch. The jabs I had to get to visit Australia in the first place were more painful, so I didn't really think all that much of it, like maybe the little guy's tentacle had suckered me a bit too hard or something. I dropped the little guy back in the rock pool then set off back towards where the families were. It was only maybe half a football pitch back to them and the halfway through the walk, I started to take a funny turn. I think the first thing I noticed was a kind of numbness in my lips and tongue. My mouth was dry so I tried licking my lips, only to find I had less and less feeling in them by the second. I put this down to the ice pop, but as I carried on walking, I felt increasingly nauseous and tired to the point by the time I got back to the families, I just collapsed down onto my bum. Obviously, they were all saying, Jenny, are you alright? And things like that, but when I tried to tell them I wasn't feeling very well, I could barely get the words out. My throat was dry. I could barely swallow, and second by second, I'm feeling more and more numb all over, until eventually, I just collapsed back into the sand. Not everyone around it looked like I just passed out, but in reality, I was wide awake and fully conscious. I couldn't move but I could hear everything they were saying about calling 000, the Aussie emergency number. Those were some of the most terrifying moments of my life. Not just because I was somehow paralyzed, but because it was getting harder and harder to breathe. I'm slowly becoming so paralyzed that my respiratory system is shutting down, but I can't tell anyone. Honestly, just writing this is so difficult for me because although it was so long ago and patches of the next few days are blurry, I can still remember the feeling of terror that came from being certain that I was about to die. So like I said, totally paralyzed but my eyes are open ever so slightly so I can't really feel what's going on but I can see when I'm being moved around by people if that makes sense. I can also see when someone leaning down over my face and gets in really really close then suddenly that feeling of tightness in my chest is gone and it takes me a second or two to figure how but realize that someone is giving me CPR. I start to make out actual voices at that point, sort of tuning into each one and I worked out that people were obviously trying to save my life, but they weren't family members. But the scariest bit was hearing one of them say, I think she's gone mate. I'm thinking, oh my god, no, 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 please don't stop, please, god, check my pulse or something. Obviously that's exactly what they did or I wouldn't be here now to write this, but the sheer bloody relief when I heard she's still with us before I could actually, suddenly, breathe again. I can't even put into words, really. After that, I don't remember anything. I think I woke up in a hospital on a respirator, but I honestly think I could have just dreamed that because the next time I actually woke up, I was breathing on my own and almost the entire family was in the hospital ready to welcome me back. I still had no idea what had happened to me, and my memory was in shambles. Even being in a hospital freaked me out at first, so that was one of the first things that I asked when I woke up. How did I get here? And the answer to the question came down to three little words. Blue, ringed, octopus. There are probably people reading this who are screaming, oh my god, no, 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 as soon as I picked up that cute little eight-limbed guy. I thought it was a baby, but no. Fully groaned, adult blue-ringed octopus, and they're some of the most dangerous animals on the face of the earth. That was actually a story I saw a while ago from a tourist from America. She had picked up a blue-ringed octopus just like I did while holidaying in Australia, having no idea what it was only be told after that it could have killed her in minutes. Hearing about that didn't half bring some bad memories. 
It's a tiny little animal whose venom can shut your entire body down in minutes, leaving you a prisoner in your own mind as your lungs slowly cease to function. Sounds like an absolute nightmare, doesn't it? Like something out of an alien invasion film or something. But it exists. It happened to me, and I only barely survived it. So please, if you're taking your kids to Australia, please properly educate yourself on the various dangers that might present themselves in any particular setting. That's exactly what I plan to do with my kids anyway, so they don't have to go through the same horror their mother endured. Many years ago, my husband and I took our kids on vacation to Sri Lanka. The flights were quite tough on them. I remember my son puking his guts up because his blood sugar was so low, and my little girl's ears popped so bad that she cried for the entire descent into Colombo. I promised them that it'd be worth it, but I was also terrified that they'd just end up hating it once we were there. But thank God, my son was sold on the idea as soon as he saw some of the wildlife, and when my daughter saw miles upon miles of gorgeous sandy beaches, she too suddenly forgot how grim the 17-hour flight was. So, at one point, my husband is off taking my son down some jungle-side roads in what was basically a walking safari tour, while me and our daughter relaxed on the beach. Anna had just turned six, so she was just a little ball of energy who burned herself out digging in the sand and playing in the surf. So as long as I keep an eye, and plenty of sunblock on her, I was free to just relax and soak up the sun. Then at one point, I just hear, Mommy, Mommy, look! Doggy! I open my eyes and feel them straining from the intense sunlight, but there, clear as day, just a few hundred yards down the beach was a dog. Anna loved dogs, and she'd point them out wherever she went, a trait that I can assure you has never left her. So I just gave her a, Oh, isn't that nice, honey? Just remember they might not want to be petted like our dogs. I know that sounds weird, but one of the things we were warned was that there's no mass vaccination of animals in Sri Lanka, not to mention very little in the ways of formal dog training. That meant that not only were they considerably more likely to bite you should you catch one in a bad mood, but it meant that that bite could lead to some very, very nasty infections. But try explaining that to a six-year-old. So me and my husband just went with what amounted to... Sri Lankan dogs can get very grumpy because of the heat, and they don't like being petted like Nana's dog does. Knowing how grumpy intense heat made her, she ate up our excuse without many questions. So, like I said, I acknowledged the dog, then just closed my eyes again and carried on sunbathing. A minute later I hear, Mommy, Mommy, look, another doggy. Again, I open my eyes, make myself a little sun visor with my hand, and look down the beach to see two dogs this time. They're both these blonde mongrel things, their breed indistinguishable as the result of probably hundreds of years of unchecked breeding. They hadn't caused us any trouble at that point, because as much as they were actually wild dogs, they were still quite chilled out. The beach cafes fed them leftovers to keep them sweet, so... They spent most of their days just sleeping to beat the heat. Trouble was, they were decidedly unpredictable, and could be your average tail-wagging good boy one minute, then something distinctly different the next. So, as I said, I look up to see two dogs this time. They were playing in the sand, getting close to the water, then rushing back whenever a wave crashed in. Admittedly, it was very sweet, so I watched them playing for a minute before my eyes began to close over again. A bit more time goes by, longer than between the first two of Anna's dog sightings. Then all of a sudden, I hear, Mommy, Mommy, look! Look, Mommy! This time, Anna is much further down the beach than the first two times she'd called me, and there's not one or two additional dogs in the beach. There's an entire pack of them. There must have been about 20 different dogs on the beach for the third time I opened my eyes. There was a tiny little Jack Russell, some long-eared spaniel type, dogs of all shapes and sizes. But the one that was apparently leading the pack was this giant, moody-looking Doberman. It was quite surreal, actually, 
seeing a pack of feral dogs just wandering around together like that. I can't speak for everyone, but where I'm from, you'd never actually see a stray dog roaming the streets, or not at least anymore. A lost dog, maybe, but a legitimate pack of strays? Not a chance. But in Sri Lanka, seeing what appeared to be a live-action version of an all-canine Disney film was a relatively common occurrence. At first, I give a little chuckle and reach for my phone to get a picture. But just as I do, I give the whole scene another look. Six-year-old daughter, pack of stray dogs. She's slowly wandering towards them. They're paying her increasingly more attention as more and more dogs stop playing and begin to look in her direction. It was this huge uh-oh moment, and as it hit me, I got up, took my flip-flops off in preparation to run, and started calmly calling out for Anna to walk back to me. I tried my best to keep calm, I really did, but Anna must have been able to just detect the panic in my voice. She stops to look around at me, this nervous look on her face, and as she does, the dogs start walking down the beach towards her one by one. I was saying, walk back to mommy, Anna, walk back to mommy, trying to emphasize the walking part because I knew the dog would only chase her if she ran. They were all staring her down, ears pricked up, and I'm praying for them to just stay put, but as Anna looked back, saw that they were closer, and started to run, they gave chase. What I felt next I don't think I can even call it fear. I had to put myself in between those dogs and my daughter even if it meant me getting hurt. That's just what a mother does. I wouldn't even say I'm a particularly brave person but I didn't think twice and I suppose that just speaks to the power of motherly instincts. I sprint forward, position myself between Anna and the charging dogs, then begin banging my flip-flops together, screaming. I wave my arms in the air, jumped up and down, banging the flip-flops intermittently and I must have looked like an absolute maniac, but my god, did it work. If all those dogs just carried on rushing me, they could have taken me down in seconds, but my wild display had them literally stopping in their tracks. Or rather, once I'd managed to psych the Doberman out, the rest lost their spunk. I still remember it like it was yesterday. Seeing him or her make this goofy, scared dog face before it literally skidded in the sand, turned tail, and ran away. As I turned around to comfort the now hysterical Anna, I realized that pretty much everyone that was sunbathing, chilling in beachside cafes or swimming had emerged to watch. And I do mean watch. Not a single one of them came to check on us and in the end, it was actually some little Sri Lankan surfer type that ran over to ask if we were okay. He was swiftly followed by the owner of the cafe we'd been visiting. He checks us over, sees that we haven't been bitten then invites us back up to the cafe's patio. Within seconds, he presents my daughter with a huge bowl of chocolate ice cream, and the man was a genius in my mind. She went from absolutely inconsolable to gently sobbing to fine within about 15 minutes. Don't get me wrong, she was still a bit freaked out following the whole thing, anyone would be, but we palmed her off by saying they just wanted to play but they might get a little rough, so it's best to stay near mommy and daddy whenever there's lots of doggies around. This made sense to her, and she was back to thinking Sri Lanka was the best place ever in no time. I suppose this has been a quite long-winded way of saying that, no, it's not a terrible idea to take your kids on vacation to more exotic places. Yes, there can be risks, but I honestly feel like the net benefit is high enough to make it totally worth it. Just be sure to do your research, and remember that a seemingly harmless situation can turn into a dangerous one in a remarkably uncomfortable amount of time. Back when I worked for the ECB, I was sent over to work in Australia for three weeks to help prep for the Cricket World Cup. It basically amounted to a paid holiday as most days we'd finish whatever was on the agenda by noon and just take the afternoons off whenever we could, collecting full pay in the process. So one of these afternoons I decided to go to the beach. I'd heard the waves were quite calm at that time of the month and it made for some lovely gentle swimming conditions. 
It was apparently calm enough for a class full of school kids to have some kind of swimming lesson, which was a far cry from the chlorine stinking acid baths we had to learn in when I was a lad. So there I am, lounging in the surf, doing a bit of doggy paddle up and down, and generally just counting my blessings. Maybe 30 or 40 minutes go by and I'm having a whale of a time, probably looking like one too, when I hear the siren type thing go off. I look up and see all the school kids getting out of the water and I assume that their lesson is over. Me, on the other hand, I'm not nearly ready to get out of the water, so I carry on doing my gentle backstroke and generally soaking up the tropics. Again, the siren goes off, but I take no notice having made up my mind that it didn't apply to me, so I carry on with my backstroke, pushing myself further and further out of the shallows. Then, out of nowhere, I hear this voice blaring out over what I'm pretty sure was a megaphone. Oi, oi mate, it said. Might want to get out of the water, the siren's just gone. I reel up, feet touching the sandy bottom, and do this kind of double take like, who, me? Yeah, yeah, you. It's then I see there's been a lifeguard on the beach the whole time, and he's wandered down to the sand to shout at me. Time to get out. I shout back. Uh, no, thank you. I, I'm not quite finished yet. The guy tried to call out to me again, but I think his megaphone seized up for a second because he gave it a little shake, trying again. The whole time, I'm just stood there awfully perplexed, thinking, is this something that happens in Australia, they can just call time when you're swimming? What kind of nonsense is this? Again, the guy starts telling me to get out of the water, and it's at that point that I start losing my temper and moving to get out just to give him a piece of my mind. Only right as I do, I hear the lifeguard say, You need to get out urgently. There's a great white mate, a shark in the water. Two people have walked on water to my knowledge. Jesus Christ and me. The day I heard that there was a shark in the water with me, I move faster than feces off a grease shovel. And I gave the lifeguard my sincere thanks and apologized that I didn't quite know the drill. Still makes me shudder just to think about it. Knowing it was there, but never seeing it. And next time, I think I'll pay a little bit more attention to the rules and customs, especially what involves giant man-eating fish. Once, when I was a kid, my family drove me out to a relative's caravan, so we all could go to the beach. This beach was nothing more than a seawall and some shale, but since the tide was in, you could actually get in the water, have a little swim in that. Hardly some white sandy Caribbean island or anything, but it was still good fun. I was a bit gutted that I wouldn't be able to build any sandcastles, but when I laid eyes on this little inflatable dinghy that my cousin had with him, I soon forgot about the sandcastles. My auntie suggested that me and Mark go for a little paddle in the dinghy, something I was only too keen to do. So we pushed out into the water, climbed in, then pushed off with our two little plastic oars until we were actually rowing around. The grown-ups shouted over on more than one occasion for us not to paddle out too far, and I really do remember us trying to restrain ourselves. But the more we got the hang of rowing in unison and all that, the more we were just whizzing up and down the beach, and the more confident we got in our abilities. Before we knew it, our parents were getting smaller and smaller on the horizon, and at one point, we both sort of freaked out about being out so far and decided to row our way back. We weren't too scared at that point, like it was more exciting than anything else, but then, as far as getting back to the shore, that proved much easier said than done. There came a point where both of us realized that although we were rowing our hardest, we weren't really making much progress. I remember looking to my left and right trying to gauge if we were getting any closer but it was too hard to discern so I just shrugged it off and kept rowing. But then it got to the point where just rowing got to be really difficult and no matter how hard we rowed, we just slowly started drifting off back into the open waters. Someone from the shore must have seen this and shouted for us to row back 
But then my Uncle Jack, who knew a thing or two about the sea and its currents and whatnot, he kicks off his shoes, pulls off his shirt, and immediately runs into the water to swim out to us. Seeing him act like that was what really clued me into the fact that we were in some kind of serious trouble, because the whole reason we couldn't make any progress was actually because the sea was literally dragging us away with some current just below the surface. So, me and Mark are kind of freaking out by the time his dad reaches us. I think we must have been five and seven respectively, so we were in total panic, thinking we were about to be lost at sea for the rest of our lives or whatever, and we only calmed down when my uncle starts dragging us back towards the shore. It was obviously quite a big ordeal, and I remember the next time we visited, there were little signs up on the lamppost saying, Caution, Strong Current, or something. My auntie was all like, See that? That's because of you two. Scared me half to death that day. We all had a little chuckle about it, but I distinctly remember thinking, but never saying lest I risk a beating, you weren't the one who was about to get sucked out into the Atlantic, Auntie Claire. And, I don't know, as much as it's something we all laugh about now, I can't help but think that there's like an alternate timeline where the grown-ups didn't notice how far out we were, and by the time they did... It was too late. I mean, sure, they get the lifeboat rescue out to find us, and knock on wood, we'd have been okay anyway. But I always wonder how close we really were to becoming front page news the following morning, and not for good reasons. One night in May of 2010, the Suffolk County Dispatch Center in Long Island, New York, received a call from a terrified young woman. When asked what the nature of her emergency was, the caller replied that someone was trying to kill her. In a display of brutal honesty, the young woman admitted that she was a working girl and that a call to a client had gone horribly wrong. She added that she had successfully fled his apartment but that she was terrified that he might be following her. When asked her location, the caller replied she was in the area of Ocean Parkway in Oak Beach, a small community located on the eastern side of Jones Beach Island. Since Oak Beach is built around a small stretch of 15-mile-long Ocean Parkway, the dispatcher told the young woman to make her way to a well-lit, open space near the highway. The plan was to position the girl in such a bright and public space that it might deter her attacker from making a move but it also allowed nearby police units to race down the highway until the caller could see and hear their blaring lights and sirens. Again, such police activity would surely deter any potential attackers. Towards the end of their conversation, the caller is said to have said to the dispatcher, Okay, I can see the cops now, thank you so much. The dispatcher then relayed the information to the patrol car, telling them the girl would be just a few hundred yards ahead of them. The caller once again thanked the dispatcher, then hung up the phone, apparently just seconds away from flagging down the incoming officers. But those officers say they didn't see any female in their early 20s standing by the side of the parkway. In fact, they didn't see anyone at all. They continued to prowl up and down the highway for a while just to make sure they hadn't missed anything, but there was nothing. The cops in question hoped for the best. After all, there was a chance she'd been picked up by a friend or a co-worker. Maybe she'd even caught a cab or found some other method of escape. But regardless, the girl's name and description were passed along to homicide and missing persons as a potential Jane Doe. Seven months later, their worst fears came true. On the morning of December 11, 2010, Officer John Malia and his trained cadaver dog Blue were hard at work. They had been tasked with searching the surrounding area for any signs of the missing girl, and for the past half a year, they had been systematically searching and eliminating grid square after grid square in a comprehensive search for her remains. Over the course of the summer, he had unsuccessfully searched several gated beach communities in the area for any sign of the missing girl, but each time, despite scouring one or two areas that he thought were of particular interest, he had no luck. This wasn't for any lack of trying or skill either. Blue, his trusted German shepherd, was a veritable expert in finding decomposing bodies. Even if they had been buried up to a depth of around six or seven feet, Blue would paw at the ground and bark and 
he wasn't often mistaken. This is why, on that chilly December morning, when Blue began to alert towards the beach near Ocean Parkway, John trusted Blue to bring him results. Lo and behold, the decaying corpse of a 24-year-old female were found in an unmarked, shallow grave in the sandy earth. But that wasn't the only set of remains that Blue alerted to that day. Even with the thick vegetation and light layer of snow, the area on the opposite side of the highway proved to be nothing less than a graveyard, with Blue alerting every couple of feet. Not only were Shannon Gilbert's remains found, but the body of the missing Melissa Bartholomew was found, reduced to nothing more than a skeleton interred in a burlap sack. Police managed to recover three other bodies in the grassy area, that of Maureen Brainerd, Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and the missing Shannon Gilbert, who Officer Malia had originally been looking for. All were within just 500 feet from one another. The following March, during the recovery of the other five bodies, the remains of one Jessica Taylor were found in a shallow grave at the side of Ocean Parkway. This was extremely worrying for investigators because what they only described as partial remains belonging to Jessica had been found eight years earlier over in nearby Manorville. It was looking more and more likely that the cops had a serial killer on their hands, as three additional sets of remains were unearthed over the following month, including those of an unidentified female toddler, an unidentified Asian trans woman, and Valerie Mack, whose partial remains had been previously found in Manorville in November of 2000. Despite mounting evidence of a serial killer being at work, it took until November of 2011 for law enforcement to announce that they believed one person to be responsible for all ten murders, that the person is most likely a native of Long Island, and that there'd be a $25,000 reward for any information leading to their arrest. As of December 2015, the Suffolk County Police had been assisted in the investigation by a number of FBI agents. The FBI stepping in was preceded by the disturbing revelation that former police commissioner James Burke had been blocking FBI involvement in the so-called Long Island serial killer murders and had been doing so for years. Burke resigned shortly after the scandal broke, and his reasoning behind blocking the FBI is yet to be determined. But the fact that a man so high up in the police hierarchy could deny such cases of vital material and human resources is deeply confounding. Whether or not he was trying to cover up the murders, or it was foolish pride that had him eschewing any federal assistance, it's anyone's guess. But Burke was sentenced to 46 months in prison in November of 2016 on charges of assault and conspiracy. Local police and FBI agents worked steadily on the case for almost two years before a Suffolk County prosecutor announced that John Bitroff, a carpenter from Manorville, was suspect in at least one of the murders. Bitroff had been convicted in May of that year of the murders of two female escorts in 1993 and 1994, and in June 2019, homicide detectives proposed steps to use genetic genealogy to identify the unidentified victims and possibly the Long Island serial killer himself. It's unknown that any such tests have taken place, but if they have, they certainly didn't implicate Bitroff any further, as no further attempts to charge him seem to have been made. Those affected by the murders had to wait years for any additional information, but in January of 2020, Suffolk County Police released images of a belt found at the crime scene, one embossed with either the letters HM or WH, depending on the orientation of the belt, embossed in black leather. Police believe that the belt may well belong to the Long Island serial killer himself, but would not comment on exactly where the belt was found. However, they did mention the new scientific evidence was being used in the investigation, and they had launched gilgonews.com a website enabling Suffolk County Sheriff's Office to share news and receive tips regarding the investigation. Even though John Bitroff had a history of murdering working girls, the complete dearth of physical evidence means we're forced to consider other suspects in the murder of some, if not all, of the victims. Homicide detectives briefly considered Joseph Brewer, an Oak Beach resident, to be a suspect, given that he was one of the last people known to have seen Shannon Gilbert alive. 
It was he that apparently hired her as an escort from Craigslist on the night of her disappearance, and told police that shortly after Shannon arrived at his residence, she began acting erratically, and he made no contact with her after she fled his home. Shannon was reportedly seen running through Oak Beach, pounding on the doors of homes in Brewer's neighborhood. Around this time, Shannon called 911 saying that they were trying to kill her. Police, however, did not find any evidence of wrongdoing and Brewer was quickly cleared as a suspect. It does raise the question though, if she was looking for refuge, would she not have simply stayed at Joseph's place? Why expose herself at such an apparently perilous moment? It also came to light that just two days after Shannon was declared missing, an Oak Beach resident named Peter Hackett had telephoned Shannon's mother to inform her that he was taking care of her. When she asked what he meant by that, he told her that he ran a home for wayward girls. When pressed, he hung up. He flatly denied this phone call ever took place when the police paid him a visit, but investigators prove, though, that Hackett had indeed called Shannon's mother using his cell phone records. It seemed all too much of a coincidence that Shannon's body was found just a stone's throw away from Hackett's home residence, too, and her family have stated on multiple occasions that they believe he had something to do with their daughter's death. However, Police later learned that Hackett had a history of inserting himself into or exaggerating his role in certain major events, and that he had done exactly the same thing with a number of other high-profile murders and disappearances around the wider New York area. Hackett later left town and seems to have been completely rolled out as a suspect by investigating police. This leads us back to former Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke, who if you remember, resigned his position and eventually went to prison for a series of corruption scandals. In December 2016, Shannon's family discovered that an escort had approached the police to state that she suspected that Burke might be connected to the Long Island serial killer case, confirming something they had long suspected. The escort stated that she had attended a party in Oak Beach in April of 2011, and it was at this party that she saw none other than James Burke in attendance. Not only did Burke proposition her at said party, but she also witnessed him engaging in some disturbingly violent behavior. According to her, Burke was seen dragging a woman of Asian descent along a carpeted floor by the hair. This appalling display was stopped by other partygoers, but the other girls present came to learn that Burke's violent behavior was caused by him being unable to climax during his time with the girl. The girl in question wasn't even a working girl and the argument had only stemmed because he'd, according to her, tried to throw a few hundred dollars at me following the encounter. I told him I wasn't a working girl and that's when he got violent. It was evident that by this point, not only did Burke make a habit of soliciting and visiting escorts, he was also prone to violence whenever things didn't go his way. As of the time of writing, the identity of the Long Island serial killer remains a mystery and for all we know, he is still very much at large. The disturbing aspects of former police chief James Burke's behavior might well just be a coincidence, and the Long Island serial killer might well turn out to be someone entirely different. But given his attempts to block FBI involvement, the murderer of 10 to 16 young women might well be one of his own blood relatives, perhaps an old friend of his who might at one point have been involved in law enforcement. It's certainly disturbing to discover an active serial killer, especially one with apparent ties to police corruption. And even though the killings seem to have subsided in the wake of intensive investigation, the Long Island serial killer may just be waiting and watching, biding his time, before he can strike again. Back when I was about 11, I was at the beach with my brother and cousins, just having a grand old time swimming and letting the waves take us out in the most comical ways possible. I wouldn't describe myself as athletic in any sense, but I've always been a decent enough swimmer, so when we all decided to start swimming further away from the shore, I was pretty confident of being able to get back. And so, we went on the shoreline becoming smaller and smaller the further we went out and swam. Before we realized it, the sun was beginning to set and in what seemed only a few minutes, 
The waves, which were already very tall to begin with, were easily triple the size of 15-year-old me. Once our moms became aware of the rough waters, they hurried to call us back to shore and for once, no one argued. Everyone was getting freaked out at how powerful the waves were getting, so having our moms call us was all the excuse anyone needed to abandon our little daredevil endeavors. For my brother and cousins, all of whom are taller and older than me, pulling themselves out of the water was a relatively easy task. But as I tried to follow, swimming and swimming with all my might, I didn't seem to get any closer to the shoreline. In fact, within a few minutes of paddling away, I was actually further away from the shore than I previously was. The waves had begun pulling my body backwards into the ocean without me being aware of it. I could even hear the lifeguard's whistle telling us to get out of the water. That's when I felt that particular heartbeat in my chest, the one you feel when you're about to ask a girl you like out, the kind that you feel when you're about to reveal to your parents the bad grades you got at school, the kind of heartbeat that indicates fear. As soon as I felt it, I realized I was in big, big trouble. I was going to become another one of those drowned kid at the beach tales mothers told their sons as a way to keep them close to the shore. My brother was completely out of sight along with my cousins and I was still there, trapped by the waves that constantly grabbed my feet and pulled it deeper into the ocean. I was panicked. I wasn't sure when or if my family would go to the lifeguard for help. Against uncertainty, I decided that I had no choice but to keep trying to swim back to shore, and that I did. It was hard, very hard, and if you ask me how I did it today, I'll tell you that I was one clever SOB. And maybe the problem wasn't as bad as I had believed it to be. Once I was able to calm down again, I knew that all those tales of drowned people always went bad when they started panicking. So I took a deep breath and began doing this little technique. Whenever the waves pulled, I'd swim slowly trying to maintain the ground I was in, and when the waves pushed, I gave it all. I swam as fast as I could, thinking, and to this day I have no idea if I was right, that the momentum of the waves plus my efforts would help me reach the shore again. Soon, I could feel the sand running across my toes once again. Only a few seconds passed before my chest laid on a thin sheet of sand and a few more passed before I could walk on it. It felt like pure bliss. I felt like aquatic bear grills for being able to come up with such a solution and was eager to tell my mom and cousins about it. Soon, of course, reality hit me again. I was received with a slap by my mother who continued to rant about how she told me not to go so far away how they were about to call the lifeguards and how dumb I had been to disobey. My family laughed at me as my mother yelled and I soon learned that I had only spent a grand total of about 10 minutes in the water. The point is, I know the beach can seem like fun, safe place to spend the summer, but it has all kinds of unseeable hazards that kids really should know more about. If they did, maybe you wouldn't have so many tragedies involving kids getting swept away or bitten by sea snakes or whatever. I mean, you never know what's in there. Lurking just beneath the surface, but sometimes, like in my case, it's the tide itself that wants to kill you. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in huge compilations and save on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below in the description. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.